So now we've got two, two strands going with the um, uh, social enterprise discussion going on upstairs. And what we're going to do now downstairs for the rest of this, uh, for the summit, is, is focus on um, what I think is an increasingly um, significant area for um, people, the kind of people who attend DocFest, people coming from a background in um, production of factual, uh, whether that's television or film, um, which is um, the relationship with and the use of, of, of archives. Um, it's an area where, in Crossover, we've, we've, we've already done some work this year in a lab that we did for uh, in the West Midlands, looking at the opportunities that digital platforms offer to the holders of archives, whether that's organizations like the BBC, whether it's museums and galleries, um, to liberate material that has previously been in some way you know, locked in cellars or perhaps on display in, in museums and galleries, but which you can only really get access to um, by visiting a building. Um, and we've seen, we're beginning to see a lot of projects, um, whether it's the Museum of London's project in London, in, obviously in London, um, w where there's an iPhone app that you can, down, you can use to see photographs actually in the location where they, where they were taken. Another project that we've worked on in um, Coventry, sort of recreating a journey through the city the day after um, the, the, the bombing during the Second World War. Um, in, we're seeing increasing opportunities for collaboration between producers and archive holders. Um, and the con one context for uh, this session now is, is that uh, Crossover will be um, working with um, the Wellcome Trust to organize a creative lab in January 2011, um, specifically to look at uh, collaborations between ga museums, galleries, other archive holders, um, and people coming from across the audiovisual industries, whether that's uh, from the games development sector or film and television. Um, so uh, somebody from the welcome will be talking a little bit more about that later. But to kick the session off, we're very pleased indeed um, to welcome um, Roly Keating uh, and um, Sam Anthony from the BBC. Um, I think it was just after I left the BBC, I think in 2006 or 2007, that um, Roly made the transition from being um, controller of BBC Two to uh, controller of the archive. Um, which I thought at the time was a really interesting and significant move. Um, so it's, uh, I think rather than do a presentation, Rowley and Sam are going to want to make this session um, quite conversational and interactive. Um, so please, will you welcome Rowley Keating and Sam Anthony. Oh. Thanks very much and uh, good morning. Uh, as, uh, as he was saying, we, we just decided to do this as a conversation rather than as a speech, although there is a lovely pulpit, or there was a lovely pulpit here, so it's a shame we didn't use that. Um, uh, my name's Sam Anthony. I work in the commissioning department at the BBC, um, but you're not here to hear me talk. I'm just going to try and elicit some interesting answers from Rowley. Um, just a brief, a few words about him. Uh, he's used to big projects. He became head of programming for UK TV on its launch in 97, and in 99 he was made BBC controller of digital channels. Uh, he then went on to become the controller of BBC4 at its start-up, uh, leading the channel launch in March 2002. Then from 2004 to 2008, Rowley was controller of BBC2 so successfully that it was named as Broadcast Channel of the Year in 2007. And from October 2007 to 2008, he also took on an additional responsibility as acting controller of BBC1. It's quite a good CV, isn't it, really? Um, but arguably, all this was a mere cakewalk compared to finding a way to deliver more than a million hours of BBC content to a public that may still not have any real idea of what that will mean to them. Rowley's warned it will take at least a decade to process more than 3.5 million individual clips, currently stored in 25 different buildings across the UK. Meanwhile, the public's hunger for on-demand content will move far quicker than that. So as Director of Archive Content for the BBC... Can he teach the old dog of the BBC the new tricks it will need to keep up and work out how to wag the long, long tail of its back catalogue? 
Roly, let's start off just with a, with a sort of obvious question, I think, which is, isn't this all just a massive, incredibly expensive exercise in uh, the British obsession with nostalgia? Uh, uh, it, it, it's nothing to do with the past. It's to do with the present and the future. Uh, we can only live in the present, and we're constantly thinking ahead. But as we live in the present, what we find we're looking at is this extraordinary accumulated heritage that we can't... We shouldn't want to get away from it's what we as broadcasters filmmakers program makers do for a living is tell stories and make stories and in the 20th century version of broadcasting um, all we could do which is a wonderful thing to do and remains a wonderful thing to do is broadcast them to the nation to audiences there and then you get a repeat if you're lucky and it's there uh, uh, um, once again what we're tackling now is the equation of Broadcasting, commissioning, program making on the one hand, and the unstoppable dynamic of the internet, which is mature now, 20 years on, we're beginning to get a feel for how transformative this is. And one of the remarkable characteristics of the internet is that it's permanent, it's cumulative, it's shaped like an archive itself. Unlike a medium which is transitory, the grammar of the web that we've all now got used to uh, tells us that once published, material should be there. It can be revisited, reused, bought, sold, talked about, engaged with, uh, uh, connected with other material. And the, the naively simple job we've given ourselves at the BBC is to try and get all those disparate bits of the BBC from right over in worldwide to the people who think about technology, rights, digitization, public partnerships, to try and think again about what it means to make and broadcast in this era and figure out how we can, well, as Frank said, uh, unlock that value so that we don't waste it, so that when we broadcast, we think about its afterlife, we think about how you can publish it um, in ways that, that, whether they build new kinds of public value or new kinds of commercial value, uh, speak to more audiences for longer in more parts of the world than we were ever able to do in the analog broadcasting age. And it is, I mean, just, I, just to, on a personal note, I've worked at the BBC 20-something years, and almost from the day I joined, I thought, just because I've got a staff card, suddenly I've got access to this treasure trove of material that the average licence fee paying audience member doesn't have. And that was just inevitable. In the 1980s, I could summon up things, and that, that inequity, if you like, was, uh, was inevitable. Um, by the mid-90s, you've mentioned UK TV, we were, be were beginning to spot that you had multi-channel television, you could make more use of some of the shows, maybe at the most commercial end, and the DVD market grew and so on. Now, 10 years, 10, 15 years after that, um, we're slipping behind in a way because the grammar of the web is all about publishing and connecting and actually almost all the frameworks we've grown up with are beginning to feel a bit creaky. Okay, so how are you going to give everybody in this country who pays the licence fee um, the equivalent of your staff card in terms of accessing the archive? Steadily and relentlessly and by many, many parallel means. Uh, and you, you've talked about it taking a, a decade. Well, I don't, in a way, that's a, that's a rhetorical flourish just to give a sense of, of the scale here. People have often talked in the past about it's all about just digitizing the archive. How much would that cost? And as if that would solve the problems. That won't solve the problems. That's just one of the dimensions. What we're trying to do is go with the flow um, of what's already happening in media. Um, and as the BBC makes sure that, that those different parallel flows join up. That means that on the commercial side of the equation, really tracking what's happening in video on demand, in download, um, with the, the, that gradual collapsing of windows and accessibility. And without commercializing the archive, because it's a far richer resource than that, um, nonetheless getting the commercial value and working with commercial partners, BBC Worldwide, other distributors and so on, to get bolder and better at using the grammar of the internet to get more content out there. But at the same time, also go with the... Um, the, the public values of the BBC. Think about what it means to be a public service broadcaster in this very connected 21st century age and identify the fact, first of all, that even if we unleashed a purely commercial model, it might touch only, what, 10, 15, 20% of the total resource that the BBC generates day in, day out. 
So we're also starting at the other end. We started very modestly. You can see on BBC Online now, um, we reckon 150, 200 hours or so of permanently available archive collections on, on BBC Online, very low key at the moment. Um, in the radio sphere, much larger, there's, there's, there's quite a lot, for instance, of the Radio 4 archive there, but almost invisible to audiences, very, very, very concealed. And we're trying to get better, clearer frameworks um, to build public publication to, to extract um, the educate, you know, identify content that has historic value, uh, educational value, uh, or that can join up to one of Frank's themes with some of the other digital resources in the public realm of the UK, museums, galleries, uh, public institutions. So last year, for instance, we did a, a groundbreaking deal with the, uh, the Henry Moore Foundation to clear, free, for the public, on the web, every hour of content the BBC has about Henry Moore. It coincided with the Tate. The Tate also contributed very generously to digitization. It was a three-way partnership. That means we now have on the open web, unlocked and liberated, um, about 48 years worth from 1951 to 1998 of every single film the BBC ever made with Henry Moore and the artworks represented there, which is now a public resource that galleries, museums, educational institutions can draw on. Uh, and that's because we had an enlightened rights holder, a great public partner, and 50 years of steady broadcasting, which was in danger of getting locked on the shelf and is now out there. Now that's in the great realm of the million hours or so, that's a tiny little fragment of it, but it's a very illustrative one because it, it begins to show the way at the public realm end of what we do about what's possible. And so is that, that something like the more thing, that's, a, that's almost a kind of mini pilot, is it? Um, it, it it's, it's a lesson learned, in yeah. other words. I, we, we hesitate, to use, the pilot I think is an over, uh, overused word, partly because it suggests that it's something that comes and goes. The great thing about that is it's sustainable. We yeah. can talk to the Moore Foundation, I think, in five years' time and opt to renew, and it can simply become a lasting resource. So all sorts of really interesting ideas there in that last answer, and, and presumably all these elements need to be factored into determining the strategy for the archive. Um, but do you think that the... How much of the challenge do you think lies in, in kind of unpicking the actual concept of archive as well as just opening the doors in by various <laughs> means? I mean, what do you think of the word itself? Uh, well, I often make it very clear to my team that our job um, is to end up in a position where we're not using the A word at all. I often say that the, um, uh, for all that the music industry got some things wrong about digital, God knows, at least in music, in digital music, there's no concept of archived music. A great Bob Dylan album from the 60s isn't an archive album. It simply exists in the present, there to be enjoyed by my teenage son or a 70-year-old equally uh, 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 and connected to something that only got released last week. It lives in a perpetual present, which, as I began, is the beauty of the medium that we now have to play with. And in a way, we're trying to bring broadcasting on a similar journey to maturity where it's just, it's programs, it's stories, it's material, it's documents, uh, and they're all uh, brought into the air. Of course, we'll still have a working archive behind the scenes. I mean, you, you, the skills, the traditional skills of archiving will evolve and continue. But the, the, the exciting, creative, audience-facing part of this will, I hope, be less and less about using the word archive and more and more about bringing those great editorial, commissioning, broadcasting skills to bear, and, by the way, technological, curatorial, uh, 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 and creative skills to bear on this resource and, and bring it to life, keep it alive now. So we won't completely kill the word off, yeah. um, but in a way it's, it's, a, it, it's an ancient word that doesn't capture the full scale of what it is we're trying to do. Okay. And do, do you think the, uh, the, 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 the audience, the licensed pair, can actually handle that much choice? And how, 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 do you, how, how can you help them make sense of it? And perhaps that might be of interest to people in the audience because they yeah. maybe want to kind of feed into that with third-party applications or ideas about how to get stuff out there or, you know, curate material, that kind of thing. H how are you going to help the audience make sense of this giant thing? Well, first of all, I say don't patronise the audience because yeah. uh, um, we're all the audience and if you go online, there is indeed an, a, a, an absolutely vast, unsorted vat of material out there day in, day out. 
Um, and we've all got very comfortable with the idea that by, in search mode, we can get better and better at identifying exactly the material we're interested in. But at the same time, sometimes we're in a mood where we want to sit back and let someone else make the selections for us and, and give us a hierarchy, give us a hit, give us a, a, a couple of choices to make. And it's in the nature of what we're doing at the BBC to try and answer both of those questions. We're doing a lot of really what you might call deep engineering to get better and better at being capable of publishing deep down quite a lot of content. Uh, one indicative example there just at a level of, of data and information is that we're digitizing the whole, um, we're using old back catalogues of the Radio Times, the whole broadcast history of all, every schedule, every program ever made by the BBC, whether we've still got it or not, and getting that online um, as a searchable resource, and we're not expecting anyone to read that from A to Z, but that's in the spirit of what Tim Berners-Lee said, you've got public data, get it up on the web. So that kind of mass publishing is part of this, uh, and ho hopefully with certain strands and so on of content, we will actually get into the high volume publishing business around some program material as well. But at the same time, in another part of the building, we're talking to commissioners, channel controllers, Richard Klein at BBC Four or whoever, to think harder and harder about what happens when you do a great, a, a great theme season on air and whether we can work with the archive specialists to get a collection of material to accompany that. Um, and there, you're shining that spotlight of broadcasting and marketing and the moment and the excitement uh, and connecting it to something very curatorial. And if you're smart, you can use that as the way, if you like, to feed the permanent collection of content, bring it to life for a period. But in this age, once it's brought to life, once it's brought there, it's there as a resource for other people to do other things with. Okay, so you've, got, so, both okay, okay, so you've got the BBC putting the stuff out there and you've got the audience that you can trust to make sense of it all. Is there any role in the middle of those two for kind of third-party plugins or, or people to come up with new ways to experience this material? And, and, and how, how would that kind of dialogue start to, say, people in this audience? Well, it, one of the reasons for coming here today is to, you know, if there's any danger of that dialogue not already happening, uh, um, uh, to say that that has to be the case because, in a sense, a, a, B, a BBC-led initial act of curation, if you like, is only going to be a tiny fragment of what the ultimate prize is here, which is gradually getting, if you like, the digital public resources and commercial resources of, of, of the UK, all, all that astonishing creativity, um, sorted and published and available uh, and discoverable in order to unlock new kinds of dynamic creativity um, to do wholly unpredictable things with it. Even with the, the program history, the genome project I'm talking about, we don't know exactly what people are going to do with that. We're hoping third parties will spot things to do with it um, that we would never think of in a month of Sundays, and that's true of, of archive content generally. So would you publish, so, say, software development kits and things like that to actually actively encourage people to come up with their own ways of working with that material? Uh, uh, absolutely, we would want to do that. We wouldn't want to do that, by the way, by ourselves. I mean, part yeah. of the... Um, the partnership theme that, that Frank began with is that we are, um, um, we found ourselves in, in much closer dialogue than I think we ever expected to even two years ago with organizations like the British Library, with the British Film Institute, with a whole web of audio visual collections uh, uh, around the UK uh, to think about how can we get more and more common standards um, of uh, uh, digitization, publication, cataloging. This, is, this sounds like old archival yeah. stuff, but it's really important uh, in the web space so that you can search once and liberate everything. In other words, if you're searching on Henry Moore in future, even through the BBC site, you can actually find out what's the BFI got, what's the Tate got, um, and there may be slightly divergent standards in terms of rights, but at least you can surface the data, and over time we may even be able to come up with more and more coherent rights agreements uh, um, that allow the maximum possible creativity that doesn't abuse the rights of some of the original underlying rights holders. In the sense, you know, there's one deal with Henry Moore, a musician, a writer, has a different kind of integrity, and we can't necessarily, as well, hand that over completely. 
but we can do a lot more, we can be far more liberal in the end than I think we are now. So could you imagine a, 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 a relatively simple, clean product in 10 years' time that looks something like, say, Spotify, but for the BBC? Uh, I think Spotify is a great product, and I think 10 years' time is a little... Who knows, yeah. Uh, uh, no, but I was going to say, for it's a little slow, in other yeah. words, but I for think... For example, they know they've uh, got the right situation sorted, for example. Uh, they have, they're working within a limited, if you yeah. like, data set. I mean, they, they work with the big music companies. I don't, I, no one knows the, 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 the deep underbelly of exactly what that deal is, but nonetheless, it's been pretty effective, and I think Spotify is a, is a very illuminating uh, service, uh, and to a degree... Uh, as soon as I started using that, you began to get a sense uh, of what it might be in the audiovisual realm mm -hmm. to think about being able to search mm -hmm. as liberally as that. And so, yes. Well, and also it, recommend yeah. stuff to, to your friends on social network and all that stuff is, is, is not happening just yet, but you it's must not. be planning it. It's not. But, but in a sense, what, in, in music, you have the concept of the playlist, highly personal, mm -hmm. highly shared. Uh, and I know, actually, when e even just... We, we've all done it as program makers. You rely on... So, Did you see that thing the other night? You must catch up with so-and-so's documentary about this. Mm. And we need to get the web, the web in particular, better and better at responding to that. Uh, and equally, navigate the, what's about to happen, which is the, um, the, the conjoining of that with the big telly screen in the sitting room. And, and how, I was going to ask you about that, actually. How much uh, of, of the success or failure of your uh, uh, project depends on the integration of computers and tellies? Um, well, I'd say of the web, of te I mean, tellies are already turning into computers, but yeah. it's how well or, yeah. or, or the, the internet, if you like, is, is plugged into the telly screen. Um, uh, again, it's a both-and story. I think as we get a better and better feel of what products and services like UView or Sky Anytime Plus or whatever will look like, um, you begin to see that there is going to be a whole new wave of innovation around the connection between a television experience and the power of the internet. I don't think it's the same as the web, and I think it will make the web more distinctive in some ways rather than less, because the web um, is one of the great inventions, and it has a granularity and ability through hypertext and so on to, 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 to publish deep amounts of data and allow all very, very rich content publishing, which in the end I'm not sure the television screen will ever do. What the television screen will, I hope, be brilliant at in this realm is offering um, insta uh, rather smartly suggested, recommended, socially or broadcaster-led or by whoever, instant recommendations for something else to watch mm -hmm. or enjoy that's directly connected to what you've just been watching. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we're already thinking about is if there is gradually, steadily, a greater resource of, say, program content you can draw on and plug in, mm. then as the credits roll in two or three years' time um, on a, a fascinating documentary uh, about Sheffield, say, um, then instead of, if you like, the, the junction offer from the broadcaster being just next on this channel, next on another channel, it can also be, and here are two very specific um, programs from what we will no longer by then call the archive, which will, uh, you might also want to watch. And the, and the seamlessness of a product like UView means that the broadcast stream can connect straight away to something served off the internet, mm -hmm. and you can just choose it there and then and watch it. And that's very potent. That, that begins in a dynamic way to get that feel of past and present just eliding completely okay. because you can choose it there and then okay. but it's much it, but it's more restricted than the web it, uh, i don't think it'll be such a great medium um for the really rich data publication mm. the link to the documentation or the photographs or the stills or the museum artifacts or whatever so i think it's we, we, we need to not think that we're getting as it were, we're losing interest in the web just because IPTV is coming along. We need to get good at both. Okay. Now, for most people, uh, the way they get their on-demand video at the moment, especially in small chunks, is um, YouTube. Um, w will all this plug into YouTube? Will everything that's available on the archive also be available via the YouTube delivery system? Because that's how most people get their little bits of video, isn't it, at the moment? Well, I don't know if it's about YouTube specifically. Yes, I mean, YouTube had, was, was a... Was a, a, a brilliant, timely innovation um, 
but even as of this week, you're seeing other brilliant, mm -hmm. timely interventions mm -hmm. also making the running in this space. The deal that Channel 5 have done with, with Facebook is very interesting here. So you're beginning to see embedded long-form video on a social net, what people thought was a social networking site. So uh, we, uh, I think you will begin to see rights holders, broadcasters experimenting for a while with publication of their content in a variety of spaces, but there's just a, a, an element of care and control. YouTube were not careful in their early years over rights or the integrity of, of what was being published. They're much better now, I hasten to say, but nonetheless, uh, they had a journey to go on to get up to speed um, with how you could publish like that. Equally, broadcasters or rights holders or archive holders will be zealous about thinking how much they want to control and how much they want to, to hand over. So I think it'll be... It'll be a bit transactional. People will learn as they go, but I certainly don't think, as it were, YouTube's the answer to everything. It's part of a mix. Okay. Well, we started slightly late, so we'll go to questions slightly late, but I think it's probably quite a good point to actually uh, go to questions. I just wanted to ask you one last thing, okay. which is uh, uh, the BBC centenaries in 2022. Does that figure in your calculations? Um, well, I, I've said it publicly before now that, that again, a bit of a, 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 um, an arbitrary thought, but we, in order to... Um, persuade people that on the one hand this is something you can't you can't do overnight but on the other hand it's a big thing that you it's a journey you can go on eventually um, I did once say that whatever the end point of this journey is let's make sure we've done it by the centenary of the BBC by that point when you've got a hundred years of broadcast history to look at in this country we should have gone on that journey from the purely linear model of broadcasting to whatever it is that's emerging out of this, which is, by the way, not replacing linear. I'm an old channel controller to my bones, and I still think linear primary broadcasting is a great durable invention and a great generator of value and energy and excitement here. But it will be that plus a whole set of other connective experiences, and that's, yeah, it would be great to have got there by then. Great. Thank okay, you. well, that's a uh, really, really useful way to start. Is that... Uh, some of you may have questions, and there are mics in the room, so there's a lady in the middle. When the, if you can wait till the mic gets to you, and then introduce yourself before you ask your question, please. Hi, my name is Dinah Lammerman. I um, used to work for the BBC for quite a long time and did a few um, related archiving projects. I just wondered, you were talking about the Henry Moore Foundation, which is obviously a fantastic um, pioneering thing to have done, to have released all of that information. Are you thinking that the motivation for those kind of things will come from big public institutions, or is there going to be a possibility where smaller, independent, digital, produced, production companies, whatever, can come and put proposals to you that then you could potentially even license uh, BBC content for use in that kind of context? Well, I, I would like to get to a point where we've got frameworks in place that... that that liberate exactly that kind of creative intermediary role to flourish. I think that's exactly right, because the, um, uh, the BBC by itself can't have all the ideas, can't make all, it shouldn't do, anyway, make all the connections that are there. This is too big for that. So um, uh, we often said that on the commercial side of the line, we only know what's of commercial value because we have commercial partners who tell us and, and, as it were, broker deals and, and, and clear the rights and get things out there on a commercial basis. And part of what we're trying to do is open up a similar dynamic on the, what you might call the public value end of the equation, where, although we'll have some initiatives of our own, we also want to get to the place where others can come in. And it may, in some cases, it will be public institutions themselves, and as we're about to hear, some of them are getting very dynamic in this space and quite rightly, on the, uh, uh, as rights holders and creators in their own right. But often already, we notice, they will come with a smart digital agency or, 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 or smaller organisation who has the energy and commitment to try and broker what is currently what is currently an extremely dense thicket um, where th there aren't these massive liberating new rights frameworks in place. We're working on it. So uh, it's a journey. I wouldn't want to give the impression that, as it were, any broadcaster yet is open for business for dozens of these things. But I think the dynamic you've described is exactly what we want to get to. So thank you. Okay, there's a gentleman at the front. <coughs> uh, hi, as a complete coincidence, um, 
I gave myself a traumatic moment the other day. I threw away about over 100 hours of BBC programmes that I had made. I didn't know I was coming along here then. But as they descended into the local tip up in Yorkshire, most of them were history programmes, I, it occurred to me, the BBC now, does it or should it not, ask for a call for what could be stored digitally of important interviews in their entirety, not just the little bits that are broadcast. They needn't be, you know, obvious uh, history, obvious oral history, like, you know, I fought in the Battle of Cable Street, but they could come from quite different programs where the producer thinks this will be an interview of record in years to come. And now that the storage problem is a lot simpler, is that what the BBC should be doing, keeping keynote interviews in their entirety for the future? Uh, really good question and theme, and it's something that I worry about and don't yet have the perfect answer to. Um, uh, uh, I'm a, I'm a bit of a hoarder. Of, I've still got the long-form interview rushes of a documentary I did on Ealing Studios in the 1980s because exactly that reason, I think, you thought this is not... Some of this stuff is not of primary immediate value, but unless it's kept somewhere, it, it won't go anywhere. It's a shame you've thrown your material away <laughs> because I'm afraid what I occasionally say to producers is just hold on to it a bit longer because, as it were, none of this... None of the big digital archives of the UK are yet organised in a way that if, if, as it were, material were handed back in, you can guarantee that will be properly presented. However, the, um, the, the category of material you've described is really important. Um, we do have a policy where we can of keeping long-form rushes. We do try to ident identify series where we think the long-form interviews of historic value. Um, it's also been a, in, a, a good theme that's come out of our um, partnership with the British Library, where they have an oral history department, they shoot their own interviews, they specialise in logging and maintaining long-form interviews, um, and even as I speak, we're discussing how can we get better and set better standards across the public realm generally to think about the interview archive as a category, because broadcasters have them, we have them, but so do others, and actually somewhere in this emerging digital public space, we need to be able to confidently key in a name and track down all the long-form material we have. So yes, we take it seriously, but no, we don't yet have the perfect answer to your question. <laughs> OK, there's a lady down here at the front, just, in, along the, oh, look, just here. Thank you. Will you introduce yourself as well before yes. you ask the question? My name is Esther Velayos. I come from Denmark. I've been working with museums and actually opening archives, especially in doing strategic uh, projects with Danish broadcast and cultural organizations. And I'm just asking you, have you thought about creating a universe for the different uses you've been mentioning, using narratives or using as a brand value, but actually creating a framework wherein people can step so users can still use it as archives, searching in archives. Small companies can come with themed experiences together with digital marketing and also a space for the bigger cultural organizations because when each of them has to approach you, it's very difficult but actually using the idea of convergence and using narrative structures which are easy to understand, you can build universes where all these kinds of users you're talking about will have easier access to get your content, get the deals with you, and know what they're supposed to do. Because else, with Danish broadcast, we see it turning into a jungle, and where the people who are very good at negotiation, which were mostly documentary producers of, of bigger production skills, got very good deals, but small companies and small learning games who can actually get it funded by media and then just get the content from you just couldn't compete in the picture because they didn't even know how to get into contact. That's uh, a very difficult question, I know. I was going to say, that's a, that's a huge question, which I don't, I, 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 it would be sort of insulting to give it a short answer. I mean, in, in a way, I think um, the very holistic vision you've described is quite close to the kind of integrated thinking we're trying to do across the BBC. I draw out one interesting theme from it, which is I think um, if we can get our heads around this, one good outcome of this, this whole new way of thinking, should be to think that the same piece of material um, can in future exist in, in different dimensions at once according to how it's going to be used. It may have a Creative Commons use at one end and be completely free for kids to use in a PowerPoint. 
It may also have a market value to be bought and traded and cut into someone else's documentary and, and it can earn its keep there. And maybe it's also just available for low res streaming over the web for archival search. And you know, at the margins, in some cases, we're beginning to see that, that integrated model um, but, uh, working. But to get that playing right across the whole value chain is, uh, is, is very challenging. So. Okay, there's a chap here in the third row. Oh, my God. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I work on a, um, uh, a lot of restoring. We restore the, the NASA archive, so mm -hmm. a lot of that's um, getting, getting stuff off, off film and uh, so a lot of telecineing and stuff on, onto HD and stuff. So I, I was actually just wondering what what's the situation at the moment with, with you doing that? I mean, because uh, a lot of BBC stuff, you know, from the, from the 70s and 60s and stuff is, is on film. And do you have a method in place to get stuff off film? And obviously, the sooner you do that, the better, because obviously it de deteriorates and uh, or some stuff gets thrown away. So. Uh, yes, there is a plan. I mean, it'll take years. Um, but uh, and, and depending on latest license fee settlement, as it were, it'll take longer or shorter. In other words, that is literally one of the tradable pieces of investment we've got is the transfer of our film, literally film archives uh, in, into digital form. We will get there. We won't lose anything. I mean, I'd make the public commitment to that. We won't, as it were, let things decay. We've now got much better preservation than we had before. Um, but again, uh, um, what we're trying to do is track that transfer by need. If this is a journey, then we're trying to get the strategy and the audience first, and over time we will transfer, we will transfer everything eventually. Um, I mean, not least the news archive, an awful lot of our pre-1983 news heritage is in the form of, of 16 mil film items, and it's not, they're not accessible at the moment. Um, I think I'm going to being asked to wrap it up. Have we got time for one last question, or do we need to crack on? <laughs> who was it who came and told me to wrap it up? Uh, well, Adam, let's have one last question from Adam in the, this there. Hello, Adam G from Channel 4. Um, you told us a little bit about the limitations of UView, and I just wanted if, uh, to know if you can give us a bit more sense of how you expect that experience to be as a viewing experience. Well, I'm, I'm really only going on what I imagine that Channel 4, you, you've already seen as, uh, as well, really, and others you know, have, have presumably seen mock-ups of, of the equivalent Sky offering. Um, I, I'm not trying, I mean, in a way, it's very hard, Adam, to talk about that without mock-ups and, and, and illustrations. Uh, I, I think the best we can say is that, that different platforms, different devices will, we hope, over time, come up with ever more seamless, simple, navigational models you can operate from your, your um, sofa that offer you relatively simple ranked choices uh, off the back of a broadcast stream uh, or in a simple on-demand way. And I've seen more and less ele elegant executions of that idea. Um, but no, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure there's anything special to add, uh, add on that. So. OK, um, I think we have to leave it there for the moment. But a, a really great uh, introduction, I hope you'll agree, to lots and lots of interesting issues, um, some of which you'll be exploring this afternoon. Thank you very much, Riley. Pleasure. Thanks.